everyone, it's Hannah and Kaylin back again with another edition of Double Talk Asks. What do singers Lord and Billie Eilish have in common, aside from global hits and massive success? Both artists have synesthesia, a neurological condition in which information meant to stimulate one of your senses stimulates several of them. Just as an example, Bad Guy might be a song meant to be listened to, but Billie Eilish says it has colors, numbers, and a scent too. We could try to explain more, but it's probably best to leave it to an expert. Which is why we called author and synesthete Patricia Lynn Duffy about what exactly is synesthesia and what it feels like to live in a world where everything is more than meets the eye and ears and nose. Listen in. I know you experience synesthesia, and there's two people yeah. here who have never experienced it but are very interested in it. Can you paint that picture for us? Quite literally, paint the picture of what it's like. You know, people kind of, I think, kind of know that it's a blending of two different sense perceptions. So, for example, you might hear something, but hearing something also makes you see something. So, you know, there are different kinds of synesthesia. There are people, for example, who hear music, but they don't know we only hear the music, they also see the music. The music would have shapes and colors and maybe even texture and maybe even a spatial quality where someone would feel they were like actually in a landscape of music. In my case, I experience words as, as having color and numbers as having color. Ever since I can remember, every letter of the alphabet, every number every, has had a color and it's just, also time, you know, a year is a very specific shape and um, the months of the year, each one has its own color. And I feel like the year is kind of, kind of, an, kind of like an oblong shape. And I can, you know, like right now we're in August. So we're in the, like this very bright orange month. But if I kind of look ahead and I, and I sort of like imagine turning a corner I'm in September. I'm in this kind of whitish gray September. And then after that, there's a kind of like white green October and then like a deep burgundy <laughs> November. I think people often think synesthesia is about color and it very often is, but there's also a spatial quality very often to um, the experience of synesthetes where you actually feel like you are in a particular place. You know, I'm a writer. So when I'm writing something, I feel like I'm, like I'm on my alphabet trail, you know? The alphabet trail is like an upwardly sloping trail of colored letters. And I, I, have, a, I have like a default position on that trail. I'm like, I'm like at the bottom of the trail between the big orange A and the big green B. And if I'm, you know, as I, as I look up the, the upwardly sloping trail, you know, just like with any trail, um, whatever is on the trail kind of gets smaller as it recedes into the distance. And so the letters get smaller, you know, as they, as they get farther up the trail. But if I'm considering, if I'm writing something and I'm thinking like, oh yeah, should I use this word or that word? Or I can sort of like imagine, I can sort of like feel myself um, gliding up the alphabet trail and standing next to a particular colored letter and and sort of like trying it out trying that word out a word that might begin with that letter um so it's sort of it's almost like if i'm writing something i'm going to a place an internal <laughs> environment when you talk about seeing a color for a word is it as vivid visually as like a mirage or a hallucination or is it how much of it takes place inside of your mind and how much of it almost seems like it's a, something that's happening in the physical world? Like you're seeing it before your eyes? If I'm thinking of your names, right, Hannah and Kaylin, you know, so Kaylin is a blue, is a mostly blue name. And, and Hannah is a kind of like, like orange tinted yellow name. The general color of the name is determined by its first letter. So because, you know, Caitlin is, begins with a C, which is a dark blue, that's the general color of your name. However, each, each individual let, letter would have its own color, and that would influence the shade of blue. And the same with, um, with Hannah. Um, you know, it's like H is a kind of orange tinted yellow. And so that's the general color of Hannah. But, you know, you have like a big orange A and then you have like this double, you know, very dark brown N's and then you have like another orange A and then and then you have like a you have an H at the end. Right. So, I mean, yeah, yeah you have like another orange tinted yellow. So, I mean, it's it's very bright. 
so actually, in terms of your names, you complement each other very well. We balance each other out. Yeah. And it's so interesting because her favorite colors are pink and like reddish and mine are blue and green. That's that's so funny. Wow. As somebody who doesn't experience synesthesia, the entire idea of this mental experience sounds exhausting to me. Is it exhausting when your mind is going to all these different places or does it actually help the creative process as a creative person? Do you ever want to turn it off? <laughs> no, never. Um, I mean, I, you know, I can't, I don't know what it's like to experience things any other way right because for yeah. as long as I remember it's been like this mm -hmm. so I think people like me who have what's called developmental synesthesia you know it's sort of something that they've experienced ever since they're they can remember you know since they were very young children before I knew how to read and write by the way each word had its own colorful um, design you know each word or name that I heard it was like this accompanying like kaleidoscopic pattern in my in my head whenever I heard it. And then I guess when I went to school, you know, you learn a new visual representation for language, right? You learn the alphabet and you, you know, you learn, you learn how to spell words. And here was like a new visual representation that began to, that shared with others. And that began to replace my, my kaleidoscopic word designs. But I think I, I, in my language development, I like incorporated some of the features of my early experience, like the colors, into the into the experience of words. And um, by the way, I should mention here that I, you know, the kind of synesthesia I have is actually a very common form, um, probably one of the most common forms of synesthesia. Although it's probably between one and two percent of the population experiences what I do. But there are other forms too. There are people that experience, you know, words as having tastes. Uh, I just recently, I'm, you know, I'm doing um, an audiobook version of my, my book right now with updates. So I'm including some new information. And I was recently interviewing a woman who experiences every word as having a particular taste. The president of the, of the UK Synesthesia Association is also a word taste synesthete. And he lives in London. And he actually did this sort of art project called Taste Map of the London Tube. So he's got like a map of the London Tube, you know, the London subway system. But instead of the names of, of each stop, he's got, you know, what it tastes like to him. There are something like 64 different varieties of synesthesia. So, and, and by the way, you probably know that a lot of um, musicians even even in our own time, like Billie Eilish has talked about her experience of music as having color. And Lord, so isn't someone else? Lord, I know, that. mentioned that. I didn't know Billie Eilish. Me neither. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, me so I mean, it's, um, you know, I think it's, and, and there have been studies that show that people who experience synesthesia are eight times more likely to work in the creative professions. So that doesn't necessarily mean they're better artists than people who don't experience synesthesia, but it does mean that people with synesthesia are very attracted to the arts. Um, they love being around the arts. They appreciate the arts. They want to be involved in the arts in some way. They want to express in some way what, what they're experiencing through art. I guess that's true of all of us. Whenever we have an unusual experience, we want to share it in some way. And, and often a way to do that is through art. Is there something physically different? I mean, I'm sure, I know you're not a scientist, but are there tests to determine what's different, what goes on in the minds and bodies of somebody who does experience it? Because then there are people doesn't. like us who don't experience it at all. And why what's, is that? Why is that what's different about us and you? Well, there have been a lot of studies in um, that show that there's a kind of, um, a kind of unusual pattern of connectivity in the in the in the brains of synesthetes or a kind of unusual cross activation mm -hmm. so for example you know somebody who experiences what i do um you know colored colored words i hear somebody say a word and it and i just can't help but experience a color at the same time um they found that they've done brain imaging studies at cambridge university actually universities all over the world are studying synesthesia 
And there have been lots of brain imaging studies that show that if you read a list of words to somebody with word color synesthesia, the part of the brain that shows activation in a brain imaging is not only the part that controls you know, language processing, that you would expect that, but also the part that you know, controls color perception. So that means that somehow you know, there is very unusual cross activation and linking of those two parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one very interesting thing that synesthesia teaches us is how very, the very individual ways in which every person's brain works. And that's, we're not only talking about synesthetes now, this is everybody in the world. Everybody is, we could say that our neural pattern for, for taking in information, processing information, learning, is probably as unique as our fingerprint. Probably no two people are doing it exactly the same way because there are so many different possible neural patterns. So this is something that I think is very interesting and important about the study of synesthesia that it kind of opens the door to our better understanding and appreciating our neural diversity. You know, we've come to appreciate more, I think, in recent decades, um, the cultural diversity of human beings, you know, the ethnic diversity of human beings. So this is another form of diversity. This is, you know, now we're realizing how diverse people are in terms of their neural patterns and how, and, and what, what implications does that have for how we are learning, how each person is learning, taking in information you know, kind of inwardly experiencing that information and accessing it. So I think that, you know, the study of synesthesia really opens a, a whole door to kind of better understanding human diversity and understanding the, the mysterious workings of the human brain. I can imagine like a scenario where somebody's in kindergarten talking to their friend and they're just like, wait a minute, you don't see, you don't see sounds or hear colors. What was the first time where you realized, wait a minute, I have a different perception on the world than other people do. And then later on, did you, was there a completely separate time when you realized there was a name for it? Until I was 16 years old, I just took it for granted that everybody, everybody experienced words as having color. I never even thought about the possibility that they didn't. Just like it never occurs to any of us to say to each other, you know, when I see the letter O, I see a circle. Is that what you see? I just assumed everybody knew that like O was a white letter and P was a yellow letter. I never even thought about it. And it wasn't until I was 16 and I was having a conversation with my father one day. We were talking about the time, we were, we were reminiscing actually about the time I was a little girl and I was learning to write the letters of the alphabet. And he was trying to show me how to write the letters of the alphabet. And during that conversation, we both remembered that I had trouble making the letter R. And so then I said to my father, you know, during that conversation, but then I realized one day that like to make an R, I just had to draw a P and then draw one more line down from the P loop. And then I was so surprised I could turn a yellow letter into an orange letter just by adding a line. And my <laughs> father said, what? what a yellow a yellow letter an orange letter what do you mean and i said well you know the colors of the letters and he said the colors of the letters and that was the first time i realized that like other people did not know what <laughs> anything about this and i to be honest when my father first said that i wondered if there was something wrong with him because i said I'm sure mom knows what I mean. And he said, no, I don't think, she, I don't think she would. But there was very little research going on then. You know, we're going back now to like 1968. You know, nobody, people knew very little about this. Um, I would say more research began in the 1980s when we had the capacity for brain Im imaging studies and scientists had, you know, the uh, technology possible to look inside the brain and see what was going on. Before that, there were always reports of people with synesthesia, but I think scientists didn't really know what to do with them. But even in the 19th century, there were many reports of synesthesia. And in fact, it became a great fashion among 19th century French poets. They actually, like Rimbaud and, and Baudelaire, 
um, Rambeau actually thought that he was kind of amazed when he discovered that there were people out there that, you know, that experienced this because he had experienced some cross sensory uh, blended perceptions as a result of drug experiences, um, as we know people can, right, as with certain kinds of hallucinogenic drugs, which were quite fashionable in 19, among 19th century artists. He was amazed to discover that, wow, there are some people out there that just experience this naturally without taking any drugs at all. And he thought those people must have some special connection to some higher realm of, of reality. And so he and you know, and some others in his circle began to be very curious about this. And there were, was actually quite a lot of um, study and curiosity about synesthesia in, in the late 19th century. And Rimbaud wrote a poem about it called Vowels, Sonnet of the Vowels. And it was about experiencing vowels as having color, um, which maybe he did, you know, you know, under certain kind, the influence of certain kinds of drugs. Um, but I think he also, uh, through his own research, learned that that was a form of synesthesia that some people out there just had naturally. And he was very curious about it. I guess since we've talked so much about everything that we've learned about synesthesia in these last hundreds of years, I guess a good way to end would be, is there something that you don't know yet, or a lot of people don't know yet, that you'd still like to learn about synesthesia? There are people that I suppose wonder whether it's possible to learn to be a synesthete um, if, if you don't not, and, and there are some studies going on now um, to, to, because you know maybe that capacity is really in all of us um, it may be more readily available in, in people that you know whose brain, cross activation is who knows for genetic reasons and they do think there's a genetic component to synesthesia as well um, you know they're just sort of that way naturally you know, congenitally, but is it possible to kind of stimulate that in, in, in other people? Is there a basic capacity there? I mean, just the fact that people can experience forms of synesthesia under the influence of certain drugs might indicate that that capacity is there in everybody. Actually, I've talked to a couple of scientists who are sort of inspired by their study of synesthesia to apply it in a clinical way to problems of uh, you know, just the fact of one sense being able to compensate for another, um, how could that be applied in a, you know, treatment model for maybe for diseases like dementia or, or even disabilities like hearing loss. So maybe there are also, you know, clinical applications that will be developed as a result of synesthesia study. 